Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Anglo-Swedish Society's first ever Zoom conference or Zoom presentation. Uh, it's obviously been brought about because of the very extraordinary circumstances that we're all living through at the moment. And it's important that we make the most of what opportunities there are to meet, even if it's remotely. Uh, I hope you're going to find this uh, session informative and educational and amusing from time to time. There will be two talks, one from myself and one from Eric Olavsky. And then at the end of the two talks, there'll be ample opportunity for discussion and debate. Uh, and of course, as many questions as people want. And the topic for today is coffee and tea as viewed in England and Sweden. And it occurred to Eric and myself to do this because uh, certainly my first experiences of going to Sweden some time ago now uh, were characterized by uh, an obvious appreciation of the fact that in Sweden, uh, coffee was ubiquitous. You would go almost anywhere and have a particular style and form of coffee. Uh, and I felt then and now know as a fact that the consumption of coffee is very high in Sweden. And obviously, being British, I'm able to appreciate the long history of tea in this country. And I think it'll be interesting for us to look at tea and coffee in their different contexts, but also wonder why one was popular in one country and the other in the other. It's not to say that we don't drink coffee in England and you don't enjoy tea in Sweden, because of course you do. But one has, I think it's fair to say, dominated the other, at least over the last period of time. And it's why that happened and what it may mean or has mean, meant in the past that I think is particularly interesting. So here we are talking about coffee for Sweden and tea for England or the United Kingdom as it will become. Um, during, the, during the extent of this talk, um, about four million cups of tea will have been consumed in the United Kingdom because uh, there are about 1.5 cups per day uh, for every UK person, and that will amount to around 100 million <laughs> cups of tea. So um, this is a, a popular and uh, multi-participatory sport, as it were. I haven't got the exact figures for uh, coffee consumption in Sweden, but I think I'm right in saying that Sweden is, and Eric will probably confirm this, the uh, country that con consumes the second most per capita coffee in the world. I think the Finns actually are slightly ahead of of the Swedes in this, if not other respects, but anyway. So to start the talk and to thank you for joining us today, I'll be dealing with this topic over about 40 to 45 minutes, that's myself and Eric, and we'll then uh, take questions and have some, I hope, nice group discussion so we can look at this uh, in a different way uh, as a group really and un try to understand this from a cultural point of view. So uh, looking at this in the heart of the matter, we're going to be looking at um, consumption patterns for sure, but also thinking about it in terms of what it's meant for the country, why these habits and practices have arisen. We're going to be thinking about ethno ethnography and cultural sociology and anthropology. That's where my colleague Eric comes in because he's a, an anthropologist. And we have to be aware that everything that I'm going to tell you quite a lot of what I'm going to tell you does come from a very Western hierarchical historical account. Essentially, that things were discovered in the West, they became popular, uh, and then were, as we'll see in the case of tea, re exported to many countries around the world as a gift from the beneficent imperial power to the poor, suffering subjects around the world. We now know that that's never really been the case. And it's no longer acceptable, I think, to rely on that as our guide for an explanation of the relationship between different countries over centuries. And other narratives are just as important. You'll see here that on the right-hand side, on the left, we've got the beautiful tea plantations, in, in fact, there in Sri Lanka. <clears throat> on the right here, we have um, an up-to-date uh, hashtag, solidarity, puns, I'm afraid, pun warning coming up, a lot of puns on the way. And here is, of course, the archetypal common tea that we drink in the UK, Yorkshire tea. Uh, and how we've got from a beautiful piece of geography on the left to a rather more proletarian uh, packet on the right 
is I think a matter of some interest, but you can see that people are still using tea as a symbol of something that really matters and can change things by the fact that uh, this uh, popped up with the Black Lives Matter UK uh, uh, le legend on it. So where did tea come from? Well, who knows? The story really is that it comes from China and the Emperor Shenong, and with a date that I find suspiciously precise, 2737 BC, this was when it was discovered. It's hard to say. Essentially, I think, as I'll show you in a moment, it's likely that people realized that the leaves of certain plants could be boiled. Maybe it was an accident, maybe it was done deliberately, and as a result, an infusion could be made, and that infusion was either health, improving health, restoring, or generally something that people thought attractive to do again and again. What we can say with more certainty is that Chinese green tea was first introduced into the coffee house scene in London, and that's interesting, tea, coffee, in that order, in around 1657. Now, those of you of a historical bent will remember that 1657 was actually in the period of Oliver Cromwell in the Republic, which lasted, as you'll know, from the point when Charles I's head was separated from the rest of his body uh, to 1660 and the glorious restoration, glorious at least from the point of view of most people, a little less so from the uh, point of view of uh, the Cromwell family. And Chinese green tea was introduced. And for example, opposite the Royal Exchange on Cornhill, there is an entrance to a network of alleyways known as Change Alley, for, uh, formerly known as Exchange Alley. Uh, and that's where this actually took place. And this was popularized by Charles II's wife, uh, Catherine of Braganza, who came from Portugal, where tea was already being consumed, and coffee. And it became, as I'll show you a little from now, all the rage in the second half of the 17th century. And it became something that, uh, uh, when a new trend is introduced, we talk about trending now, and things uh, moving at, at a rate, uh, new ideas, new concepts, new things to try, new things to experience. These things, of course, move at a tremendous lick uh, in our century, the 21st century. But even then, tea uh, became very popular in a certain section of society. And absolutely everybody wanted to have tea and to show that they had tea, to show that they were in touch with the times. And indeed, as I'll show you a little later, very wealthy because the initial administration use of tea was really only reserved for those who had very deep pockets indeed. So you can see here the Emperor Shenong on the uh, left here, and essentially the story, it's a beautiful apocryphal story. And in the tea and coffee sagas are full of apocryphal stories. Here he is sitting under a bush. Some leaves mysteriously are falling into a pot of boiling water. He's got three cups there, so he clearly knows something good is going to happen. Uh, and then uh, we, the, left, the rest is left to our imagination, but we can clearly understand that an infusion was made and then Shenong had a jolly good time with his tea, which he then shared with friends, etc. On the right hand side, I was talking about Exchange Alley, right plum center there on the top. If you look, you can see the word thread, and underneath that, the Royal Exchange on Cornhill. And just underneath that, if you just follow the O downwards down the picture, you can see Exchange Alley. And, and that's where some of the earliest tea consumption took place in London uh, in an area that was already popular for discourse for some trade and uh, the use of coffee. Now, uh, I warned you, I did tell you that there are going to be some puns and here we have some puns. So we're gonna start with the idea of gravity. So why would gravity be something of relevance to discuss at this point? And I, it's really to show you the three things that have happened that have some link with the, the with consumption of tea it's not 100% uh, clear that all of these are in entirely tea related. And the first one of these, the gravity is probably quite spurious, but it's a good story and good stories are always worth telling. So here's the jolly fellow, uh, he's Isaac Newton. And in 1669, at the age of 26, he was appointed Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge, the very same chair that uh, Hawking uh, was occupying until his uh, death uh, shortly a uh, time ago. And William Stukeley wrote in 1752 that Newton had said that after dinner, 
The weather being warm, we went into the garden and drank tea. Now that's true, that's jolly quick. I said 1657 for the first time it appeared in London. And here is um, uh, Isaac Newton, essentially in 1661, four years later as a young man, uh, out of London, uh, he went into the garden and drank tea under the shade of some apple trees. What he was doing up there was sheltering, not just from any inclement weather, but actually from the plague. He was sheltering from the 1665 plague. And he went there in 1665 and 1667. It's not far from Lincoln. It, it's a place where his family had property and it was easy for him to get to from Cambridge. And then it is said by Stukely that Newton wondered why the apple should always descend perpendicularly to the ground. Why shouldn't it go sideways or upwards, but constantly to the earth's center? And assuredly, the reason is that the earth draws it. Draw, T, well, okay. I don't think that was a pun that was intended by him. There must be a drawing power in matter. So Newton went to this family home he had in Woolsthorpe for two long visits. And he not only considered what might be the drawing power and eventually postulated that it was a force, gravity, but he also looked at the prismatic uh, diffraction of light. So this was not quite an annus mirabilis, a little bit perhaps over a year. It was certainly a period in, in which he had the most remarkable insights, which went on to change all of our lives and understandings, and obviously leading forward to uh, modern concepts such as quantum mechanics, etc. So here is an apple, a red one here, who knows whether his was red or green. And here is an example of the uh, Naturalist Principia Mathematica, uh, an early edition, 1686, when he put together all these ideas and was uh, publishing. Clearly, uh, he had rivals, uh, one of the great rivalries in science with uh, Robert Hooke. But uh, it is um, his name, uh, Newton's name, that comes to the fore when we're discussing these things. So when we're looking at tea, we've also got to consider some of its early uses, or at least its early applications. And what seemed to happen is that intrepid sailors and adventurers and voyagers from many countries would go around the world and discover all sorts of things. We, we ourselves in England can remember Sir Walter Raleigh discovering, in inverted commas, the potato and bringing that back for a, a somewhat uh, querulous and interested uh, Elizabeth I. But here we are a little bit later, and we have things like the Traité du Thé and Traité du Café du Thé et du Chocolat. Uh, and essentially, people were bringing these things back, beautifully illustrated documents and uh, books, and with detailed instructions about how to use and partake of these things. Uh, beautiful pieces of work. And a lot of the early interest, certainly in coffee and tea, was for their putative health benefits. Something that actually hasn't gone away. I'm not really going to cover that in my lecture, but actually there's quite a lot of interest in the health uh, restorative properties of tea and coffee, uh, even today, and there is some evidence, albeit not ideal. Uh, and indeed, in Eric's talk, he'll uh, mention a particular experiment that took place comparing uh, coffee consumption uh, with tea or other uh, beverages. So this was a very important early phase in the uh, understanding of tea. But again, this would really only have been to highly educated people with the wealth and time to read these sort of treatises. Then we have a, a rather more, a rather darker period where in 1773, uh, we had the Boston Tea Party. Of course, this was all around um, taxation and representation. And it was uh, as described at least by the Americans at the time, the, members of the 13 colonies, a political and mercantile protest by the Sons of Liberty. It took place on December the 16th, 1773. And what had happened in 1773, when in May, was the Tea Act, which allowed the British East India Company, I'll mention them again in a moment, to sell tea from China in American colonies without paying taxes, apart from those imposed from the UK. And the American patriots strongly objected to this because they see it, saw it as a violation of their rights. So demonstrators, some disguised as Native Americans, destroyed an entire shipment of, sea, of tea sent by the East Anglia Company. That was, of course, a shot across the bows in many ways 
uh, for what was going to happen, uh, culminating, of course, in the War of Independence and the loss of those 13 colonies and the foundation of America. And that, that was certainly about the most egregious act of revolution you could possibly imagine, tipping our precious tea into Boston Harbor. So a little more history. Um, what we have there, three pictures, the beautiful uh, tea plantations, of course, on the left-hand side. In the center there, a beautiful tea clipper. And the tea clipper was designed to get the tea across from Ceylon or wherever else it may be coming from back to the UK as fast as possible. So this could be done in, in as little as 11 days. And there was a great rush on to get the tea, the earliest tea crop possible, to get that back to the UK as fast as possible. And there was a lot of competition between companies and ships and people, and there was a certain amount of speculation and celebration for those who actually succeeded in those aims. Now, of course, those of us who know Eugélie Nouveau will be very familiar with the razzmatazz of trying to get that wine back from France as early as possible. It's freshly pressed. Frankly, it's um, horrible. I'm sorry to say that. It's very rarely uh, a very attractive drink to drink, but there was an annual competition to get that back. It seems to have died out a little bit now because people have realized that it's probably a little better to wait for the wine to mature before trying to drink it basically as soon as it's been made. And on the right-hand side there, we can see the um, degree of precision with which tea was drunk, the, the uh, apparatus that was necessary for drinking tea, and the refinement of the people that were seen to be tea drinkers. So uh, again, this is coming into the idea of wealth and privilege at the beginning of the tea history. And indeed, the grandest of beginnings, because we have Catherine of Braganza here on the left. She was a Portuguese queen. She was queen consort of England and Scotland and Ireland as the wife of King Charles II, so from around uh, uh, 1660 to 1685. Um, in the 17th century, tea having been introduced to, to England, uh, there were a number of things that were also part of that, including beautiful casks and chests, or caddies as they're called there, as well as another a variety of other things in, in terms of uh, boiling the water and storing the boiled water and the tea itself. But clearly at this stage, the beautiful tea can make, it's something only for the very wealthiest of people. But having caught on at the court, as it were, uh, it became popular in, in the, the, the highest echelon of British society in the 17th century. Now it's time to mention the East India companies. There were quite a few of these. Even Sweden had an East India company. So I think it's fair to say it was a little less adventurous and successful than the two here described. The Netherlands one, founded in 1602, and the British one, founded in 1600. And these were essentially mercantile organizations dedicated to transporting and moving things around the world as a form of trade. For example, the Dutch discovered peppers from Indonesia and other places, and they were able to import these into Europe uh, at huge prices, uh, something that set uh, alarm bells ringing in, in London because their efforts to become profitable were a little slower to be successful. But both companies, uh, went round the world and essentially got things from places and brought them back. Sometimes they would directly import them into a country and leave them there, but on other occasions it was more profitable to bring a crop or a, a produce into one country, whether it be Holland or the UK, and then re-export it at a greater price. So some of the trading patterns were, the, were obviously driven by profit, uh, and this, as I'll show you a little later in my talk, likely had an influence on the spread of the popularity of tea in the UK. And Eric will also mention in his talk uh, the importance of uh, import and export for coffee in Sweden. So tea in England, I show you here, is essentially luxury goods uh, bought from a long way away, uh, arriving in England. And it was England in those days, by the way, because uh, it wasn't Great Britain. I mean. Scotland and England came together in uh, uh, 1707, and then Wales was added in 1800, and uh, Ireland in 1922, depending on how you define these things. So uh, it, it was essentially in England, and you can see that uh, by now, the panel on the 
the right hand side in black and white is not the very highest of society but these are well-to-do mercantile classes in Victorian England beginning to enjoy uh, tea uh, uh, as a uh, celebrated and a drink of refinement frankly not just an everyday cuppa that you might have at the end of a hard day so from the very highest classes you can see here with um, this lady uh, ceremonially taking tea in, in India, uh, a very big part of the way that India was, uh, was managed was obviously from the East India Company, uh, which uh, for a very long time essentially managed that whole sector of the British Empire. And even today, as we can see on the right hand panel, we can have a, a, a wondrous time at uh, the Ritz or another place uh, to have a, a beautiful afternoon tea ceremony. But of course, tea wouldn't really have got very far if it had simply remained as the province of the super wealthy. So um, what happened uh, really from the 19th century, and perhaps from the 1830s, 1840s, when uh, slavery was banned, when um, there was the very beginning of a representative form of democracy, obviously it took a very, very long time. You had the corn laws and things. So people were beginning to be uh, uh, better educated, that there was a slightly larger, wealthier class, and slowly but surely tea began to be something that people would drink, uh, by preference, by choice. It was cheaper than coffee, as I'll show you in a minute. But there was another factor, and that is the temperance movement. There was and always has been a, a, a great thirst and enthusiasm for alcoholic beverages in the UK, and I might point out no less so in Sweden. But in order to try to push that along, tea was thought of as being nourishing and of course had none of the pejorative or detrimental qualities that people ascribe to alcohol. So tea was uh, frequently used in that way. Tea was encouraged at work. You can see here in the middle panel, this is from the Second World War, a group of ladies in the factory because the men are all out fighting. Uh, and we have builders tea and, and then subsequently Yorkshire tea to show that we're really now dealing with uh, a situation in which normal, uh, humble, not necessarily wealthy people will have this as part of their daily ritual. Well, certainly, uh, I'm not old enough, of course, to have been in any of these pictures, you understand that, but I can certainly remember my parents uh, automatically having tea. It was unthinkable, uh, at least where I was brought up, to have very much in the way of coffee. Coffee would be something you'd have um, if you were going out for a special dinner somewhere, but at home it was uh, inevitably and an always tea. Here's a map of where tea comes from. Initially, of course, it's China, but we can see many different parts of the world. You can see South America on the left there uh, in the countries, um, uh, particularly Brazil, but also Argentina. You can see a lot of tea in Africa, particularly in East Africa. And then there's, as you can see, China, there's uh, Russia, and there's Japan. So it's uh, widely available. Um, not much of it, of course, in Europe. Uh, you can see there a tiny little bit, uh, if you've got good eyes, uh, of Portugal, but not very much, in fact, there. So it always involved, or seemed to involve, it was coming back to Europe, then considered the centre of the world, very long, and sometimes arduous and even dangerous, uh, uh, long voyages uh, by ship to get the stuff back. Of course, in today's world, with uh, rapid freight and rapid transport, this is no longer a, the big issue that uh, once might have been the case. Now, why did tea win, if there is such a thing as winning and losing, in the UK or in Britain? Uh, why did it win over coffee? Well, I think there are a few factors. Um, none of them, I think, is a knockout blow, but um, they are, uh, I think, relevant to the discussion. First is royal patronage. Remember at the beginning, I was talking about Charles II and Catherine of Braganza. So that certainly started the thing off. And then what did happen in the UK was that the coffee that was brought here, remember coffee was here before tea in the UK. Well, that was re-exported from the UK and exported for profit. It actually was more profitable to bring it into the UK and then re-export it than it was to leave it here. So that certainly pushed the price of coffee uh, up in the UK so as not to have it stay here. Coffee also required some form of equipment and a grinding apparatus or an ability to percolate the thing. Um, more difficult than tea, neither particularly difficult, but nevertheless a minor degree of impediment to the spread of coffee. 
So although tea was initially a little bit more expensive and a bit more special because it happened after coffee and tea was the next special thing, gradually tea prices, prices were lower. You can see that in the two panels there. Uh, you can see coffee with the open uh, squares there as opposed to the fully black closed squares. You can see that as time went on, the price of coffee stayed high and the price of tea dropped progressively. And then, as I explained, there's the use of tea as an alternative to beer or gin. Gin, of course, a great talk topic for another day, the gin era of the early 18th century, uh, which in a way led on to, to beer. Was that interesting? It was that way around. Um, this was a way for the teetotal, uh, sorry about the tea, uh, the teetotal uh, uh, movement to try to wean people off or prevent them going on to alcohol. So essentially, it was partly commercial, partly ease of use, partly distribution, and then I think it became, frankly, habit. So is this stuck forever? Are we always going to love tea in the UK? Well, I think we are. But it is true to say, and it's true because it's from the Telegraph, so it must be true, doesn't it, that Brits are drinking 22% less tea than five years ago. Uh, this would be, let's say, mid-2010s. Um, because of... Well, because coffee culture has become very uh, ubiquitous, hasn't it? Coffee bars, coffee chains. Don't see that with tea. Tea's more domestic. Coffee's, again, a bit more special for going out and having something. And I think traditional ideas about tea are changing. Um, the, the consumption has been falling these last three decades, four decades or so. And I think um, that's probably more pronounced in millennials. I'm apparently something known as a boomer. Well, that may be, doesn't sound very attractive to me. But anyway, that's what millennials call me. And that these are turning instead to herbal or green teas, whose sales have uh, considerably increased recently. Partly, perhaps, through health claims and uh, the enjoyment of these things, and partly because I think people are keen to try new things, and tea essentially is a sort of eternal quality, and um, people are keen for new experiences, I want to do something a little bit different, even if perhaps after trying the other forms of tea, they might switch back. So um, here we have a whole stack of different teas. As you can see, we all know we've got black tea, we've got white tea, uh, we've got uh, Japanese teas and et cetera, et cetera, green teas. Um, they're not all, I mean, they're all teas, of course, they're all made from leaves, but they've got different uh, taste profiles. They've got different compounds in them. Uh, that in England, we are obsessed by having milk in things, if we can. So um, very often, we would be putting milk in tea. This is really anathema to somebody who really understands and knows the quality of real tea leaves prepared in the proper way. There's a great deal of razzmatazz around the temperature at which you should drink the teas or prepare them. And there are kettles that have different settings for different sorts of tea. I've never quite got that far, but that's just my loss and lack of enthusiasm for the minutiae and the details of these things. So I think in one form or another, tea will always be with us in the UK, and it has spread throughout the world, and it's hard to conceive of another beverage that will supplant it completely. Uh, so I think it's always going to be part of our lives. Uh, and is it time to turn over a new leaf? Well, yes, possibly. But what I think we should do now is turn over a new leaf and let uh, Eric uh, do his uh, talk and he'll give you a different, um, a different perspective, shall we say, on, on the beverage, uh, and in particular, talk about coffee and how that played a role in Sweden. Thank you very much, David. Um, I will, as discussed, or as, as I'm sure you understand, I will uh, cover mainly the sort of Swedish narrative for this. But as David has hinted towards uh, a few times in his uh, in his in his part, portion of the presentation, this probably is relevant for most of mainland Europe with some detailed differences, of course, but I think the overarching story, the overarching story beats remain largely the same. And you'll also see some, uh, some kind of connections between uh, the narrative that David just put forward and the kind of narrative of coffee's hegemony in Sweden, so to speak, whereby um, the, the, the main difference is that the, the beats are the same, but the main difference was that one country uh, lean towards one drink rather than the other for 
uh, reason that I hope that I hope will become uh, clear soon. But first, I just want to give a very quick rundown of coffee's history. Um, it's largely understood to have to uh, hail originally from Ethiopia, and uh, there's quite a famous Ethiopian myth that says that coffee was discovered at around about uh, around about 850 uh, AD. Less specific than David's uh, year for tea, granted. 337. Seven. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, but in this case, or so the myth goes, uh, it was discovered by a goat herd, by a goat herd called uh, Kaldi or Khaldi. I'm not great at uh, kind of Ethiopian pronunciation. But Khaldi noticed that when his goats were nibbling on the bright red berries of a certain bush, they became uh, energized. Uh, in some stories, they even outlined that they were bouncing. They were bouncing all over the place, climbing, climbing trees, going completely ballistic. Um, most likely, they just got a little bit more runny and crazy. But I doubt they were bouncing all over the place. Uh, and he decided to try this for himself and realized that it did indeed give him energy. So, in his exhilaration, he ran to a nearby Sufi monk at a monastery. Uh, and described his uh, his experience, and the monk was deeply disapproving of this. That you know, it was against all sorts of rules and unnatural and everything else. So he threw the berries into a fire, and then the aroma convinced him. So they took the the burning berries out of the fire, put it inside some water to try and cool them down, and there made the first cup of coffee. That is how the legend goes. It wouldn't surprise me if it happened around about that way where somebody found the bush and by accident made a cup of coffee. But it's important to remember that it started in the, in, in the kind of what we today call the Islamic world and from there eventually came to Europe. Uh, by the 15th century, it was being grown mainly in the Yemeni district of Arabia. And by the 16th century, it was known all the way over, over in Persia and had established itself much across the Ottoman Empire. So today's, say, Egypt, Syria, and obviously Turkey. Um, when it came to Venice in 1615, the local clergyman called it, and I quote, the bitter invention of Satan, end quote. And it caused such a stir in Venice at the time that even Pope Clement was dragged into this whole discussion around coffee. Um, he, being a reasonable pope by the sounds of things, I don't know much about the history of this particular pope, uh, he decided that he needed to taste the beverage before he could pass any judgments. And so he did, and he was sold from the beginning. And basically, rather than condemning it, he gave it papal approval, and that obviously increased its, uh, its popularity across, across Europe as a whole. Um, but as far as Sweden is concerned, I want to start with a, uh, a little vignette covering or including our, um, uh, our king, uh, Gustav III, whose, this story is arguably apocryphal, but it's, I wouldn't surprise me if there's some truth to it. He really hated coffee. Um, he in fact hated it so much and he was so convinced that it was bad for you and even outright called it a poison that he wanted to convince people that this was in fact the, the truth. So he constructed what is arguably the world's first twin study, but arguably, uh, where he, whereby he found two identical twins who were both condemned to death and their sentence was commuted to, uh, to life imprisonment. But for the rest of their lives, they had to drink three pots of coffee and three pots of tea a day, respectively. And the experiment would basically check who died first and therefore hopefully prove Gustav III's point. Something we will, uh, something we will get back to uh, in a little bit. But it's interesting then to consider that Swedes today drink a, I think in some parts of the world, we might consider an absolutely obscene amount of coffee. Uh, we drink the third most per capita, per capita in the world. Uh, I read various averages, but it seems to even out somewhere between five and seven cups of coffee a day for the average Swede, which is intense. Uh, there's also a lot of social importance of the coffee in Sweden. Think about fika, the kind of coffee breaks at work, the sharing and the socializing elements of it. So it's then an, an, 
you'd be surprised as well. There, there's a very broad philosophical discussion going on on the internet as to whether you can even have a fika without coffee. That's also something we're going to get back to later. Uh, so hopefully I will answer that for you. But it's interesting to consider that we had a king some 300 years ago who despised coffee so much that he need, he felt the need to prove that it was poisonous. And his country has seemingly rebelled and refuses to buy into that particular narrative. So what happened? Now, coffee was off to a very rocky start in Sweden originally. Uh, the first recorded Swede to have tried coffee was a man called uh, Klaus Wollam in uh, 1657, as he was the Swedish ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, I believe that's him in the middle with the extremely starry hat. Um, you know, you need to show off when you're the ambassador. Uh, and after he tried it, he wrote down in his diary, diary and that he was all but impressed with the drink. He wrote, and this is granted through translation, that it tastes not but ill. One feels a need to wash one's mouth after having imbued it. So he was not sold on the idea of coffee. Uh, tea, on the other hand, came to Sweden uh, not, not long, far after he, uh, he first tried his coffee in the Ottoman Empire. And he came to Sweden in, in 1685. And contrary to what you might expect, Sweden was actually one of the largest tea importers of Europe at the time. It was uh, outrun only by the Dutch. Uh, Gothenburg became the center for the Swedish tea trade in particular. It was also the reasoning why Gothenburg had been built uh, some hundred years or so earlier when it was originally founded and expanded upon, actually, as well, uh, because it was supposed to be Sweden's shipping and trade hub, uh, trade hub, more or less. And Sweden made an obscene amount importing all of this tea, but we consumed none of it. We, we immediately sold it on to uh, to ma mainly what is today Germany and Central Europe, and effectively became the, the kind of sole supplier for that whole part of the world of, in particular, tea. So we imported an obscene amount of it, but it was not a consumer good. It was purely a trade good. Um, coffee, on the other hand, was first, uh, the first deliveries of coffee came roughly in the 1640s, but we're not really sure the nature of it or whether that was more of a trade good or an actual consumer good. It's, the records are very, very uh, sketchy on it. But it was popularized by Karl XII, after his, in particular after his return from his exile in Bender in 1715, uh, something Dave and I actually covered in a previous presentation of ours. Uh, and upon his return, he brought a Turkish coffee maker with him back to, uh, back to the courts. Uh, and also, it seemed that he was very smitten on the drink while he was in Bender, because according to Ottoman records, the Swedish king and his general entourage uh, requisitioned three and a half kilos of coffee per day, which I hope wasn't just to his own personal consumption, because I'd be genuinely concerned. Uh, so it turns out, as a bit of a side note, that Sweden seemingly has a lot to thank Turkey for when it comes to our cultural, uh, the things we now culturally treasure, including the cold dolma, the meatballs, and now coffee. Uh, at this rate, I'm concerned that soon the dollar horse will also be considered something Turkish, and then we'll all be very, very concerned. Uh, so coffee, in short, firmly entered Sweden from the Turkish tradition, and it was most, in fact, the most prevalent style of coffee in Sweden until the early 1960s. Uh, when it started shifting more towards the drip, uh, the drip style of coffee, which incidentally I read actually spread from the south to the north. So there's like a very particular geographical development of that. Um, in contrast on the, on the other hand, tea was from around 1700 onwards, largely a medicinal drink. Uh, and to kind of pick up on a point that David made, it was effectively just tea in hot water. So you, it was the dried leaves put into water and infused. And infused. it was sold almost only by apothecaries and pharmacies. Uh, still, Sweden was a very large importer and reseller of tea. Um, but mainly, again, it was only consumed as on medicinal grounds. Uh, in fact, Carl von Linnaeus said that tea is a good drink for, uh, and again, I quote, for those who the previous day imbued into one's own body drinks strong, sharp, and tough, which I think is my favorite description of alcohol. Uh, I, I, I shall start referring to them as drinks, strong, sharp, and tough. Um, but he also did point out that he believed it to carry side effects such as making one's mental faculties slow down if consumed regularly. So it was 
understood in this sort of trade-off light. But nonetheless, it had started developing more of a sort of day-to-day -day consumption in the country. Uh, but, and this was around about 700. So when Carl XII came back from Dendra in 1715, he, that was basically sort of, it ended the tea development even before it could properly begin. Because and th this happened not necessarily on the grounds of taste or preference as such, but rather anybody that could afford either tea or coffee wanted to do what the king was doing. And because he came back with coffee, it, 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 it sort of became the prevalent drink about, among, the, uh, among the aristocrats effectively because the king liked it when happened to have taken brought it back from Turkey. It was it was very much a social uh, a social development in that sense. So to return to be to the Viet from the beginning, coffee did win out over tea. In fact, much like Gustav III's experiment. Uh, so the, what we do know about that is that the tea drinker died first, but he did also die at the age of 83, which is probably very impressive or at kind of at, at the time we're looking at here. But, and it remains unknown when the coffee drinker did die, but we do have it in, our, in, in records that he did outlive his twin brother. So that experiment accidentally disproved the point, I suppose. It's also worth pointing out, however, that both men did outlive the king. Uh, he never actually saw the end to his own experiment as he was kind of almost mystically assassinated at, the, at a masquerade ball in, uh, in 1792. So he unfortunately never lived to see the pain that this might have brought him. Uh, now, coffee increased in popularity from the moment it entered Sweden. Uh, and in 1728, Stockholm had around 15 coffee houses. But they never really gained the political promises, uh, prominence that you saw in other European countries, perhaps most notably France and Austria, where they became effectively the the, the hotbed for new radical ideas. I mean, and to, to some extent, the French Revolution was fermented, or the ideas behind it fermented in coffee houses. Instead, the coffee houses became sort of more a target for political policy. Uh, they became more of a point of contention. And uh, Sweden, in fact, outla uh, outright banned coffee several times between uh, 1756 and 1823. Uh, these bans were typically a means of balance in Swedish trade, trade deficit because both of these drinks have to be aggressively imported. Uh, but it's notable that the one in 1756, so the first coffee ban, was actually pushed through the Swedish Riksdag by, uh, by peasant representatives who were basically angry that the aristocrats had banned the practice of moonshining in the country and wanted to strike back and therefore removed the ability for the upper classes to drink coffee. Um, but Swedish trade deficit when it came to both drinks was a recurring concern. Uh, after naming the tea plant in uh, 17, uh, 1737, Linnaeus imported one into Sweden. Uh, it arrived in 1750, uh, 1763, even though it was due to arrive actually about 13 years earlier, but apparently that plant fell off the boat. Um, Sure, there's a story there somewhere, but I couldn't actually find any more details on it. Uh, but one of the reasons he imported it was, as David alluded to earlier, was to try and start a domestic tea production in Sweden as a means of cutting down on the amount that we had to import. Needless to say, these plantations never really took off, um, as we don't, we're not really known as much of a tea producing nation today, and David even had a graph to prove as much. Uh, and even Linnaeus realized this. He commented in his diary that, quote, the tea bush seems not to take well to the colder Swedish climates or perhaps, or perhaps the harshness of the soil. Uh, so that unfortunately was never really due to be. Now, coffee remained largely an up, upper middle class to upper class uh, drink until the late 1800s or early 1900s. Uh, this is uh, as for the reasons you, you'd expect largely it always had to be imported. It was uh, expensive. And in coffee's case, it also required quite a lot of equipment at home from, and, and also know-how to grind the beans, to roast the beans and so on. So it never really, so it remained a very particular part of society. However, industrialization changed everything because now coffee could be roasted in factories rather at home. And you could even, as a result, buy it pre-ground. So all you needed was some sort of percolator. In fact, in the Turkish style, you just put it in a pot of water and skim the surface more than anything else. 
And so that was one contributing factor as to why coffee started opening up. And the other one was, of course, that industrialization also allowed coffee to just simply be cheaper and more attainable. It was easier to import. It was quicker to import. Uh, the production process effectively just started benefiting from a new from a new degree of economies of scale. Now, as a point of comparison, in 1882, Sweden imported around 12,000 tons of coffee in that year. By 1913, Sweden imported 37 tons. So we're seeing a very marked increase in pure, like in pure tonnage and therefore accessibility. Um, this change also affected the nature of the coffee house itself. And it started turning into more of how we understand the cafe today. The coffee house of the previous of the, of the century previous to the 18, 1800s or so was very much what we'd think of a sort of gentleman's club with a very, you know, they only usually only let men in and if they let women in, it would be in separated rooms and so on. These new, these new cafes, if we could call them that, actually known as Schweizerio uh, in Swedish or Swisseries, because they had this imagined idea that they came from Switzerland. Um, they were more akin to what we imagine a cafe to be today. Basic furniture and chairs, they sold more, uh, more kind of biscuits and cakes and sweet things rather than kind of being somewhere where you would spend, uh, spend a whole day in. So it changed the nature of who drank coffee and, and, and became not only accessible from, the, from an economic standpoint, but also more socially accept, uh, accessible, which is an important thing to consider for what uh, comes next. Because one might wonder what teetotalers, born again Christians and socialists might have in common. It's a, eclectic bunch and sounds like the beginning of a joke. Uh, the workers' movements, the teetotal movement and the Christian revivalist movement in Sweden all founded around about the same time in the, uh, in the mid to late 1850s. And they were in fact, through various framings, deeply intertwined with the shifting of both Swedish culture and Swedish politics into the sort of liberal democracies that we know today. And coffee plays a central role in all of this. Uh, and it's also a very multifaceted role, which is fascinating to consider. Uh, the teetotal and revivalist movement obviously pushed a narrative for the evils of alcohol as a whole, uh, that it was bad for, bad for the soul, bad for the body, it made people do bad things. Uh, where, and this was something that the Swedish labor movements was willing to have to, per, to pick up on because it effectively gave them a, a bigger mouthpiece. So they bought into the same narrative and effectively reframed it in traditionally kind of socialist or labor union terms where it was alcohol could be used as a means of controlling the people as you can see on the uh on the uh left hand, whoops, on the left hand side of my slide uh the whole idea is that you know you'd get your paycheck you'd get drunk and then you'd stumble home and fall asleep on your doorstep and therefore rather than taking care of your family or your children and so on so it was seen as this controlling factor for the kind of lower classes as, as it were and from here drinking coffee turned into somewhat of a political statement or a, mo of, or a moment of resistance in of itself because if you ensure that you took the coffee break that you were entitled to at work you were looking after yourself more than you were looking after the for example factory owner in this case so it became at a very very prominent central drink among uh, among the labor movement and the kind of early social democratic movements in sweden and it follows naturally that cafes thus became a center for center of organization in this case this is where people met to discuss their ideas to discuss what to do and how to take things forward and so on and so forth and this is mostly or very very clear in the etymology for the sweet for the word fika there is no clear there is no clear winner on this but it seems to come from three potential uh roots so one is that it was a prison slang from long home and prison in stockholm where that, that's basically what they called it as a sort of rhyming slang it could have also been from the secret language among the stockholm chimney sweeps which until i researched this i did not realize was a thing um, or it could have been a, uh, a type of factory worker slang called back slang, where a word is simply inverted. But what all of these stories or what all these ideas have in common is that fika is derived from the word coffee, whether it's inverted, turned around, rhymed, or so forth. So we can say that, number one, this might actually finally settle the discussion as to whether 
Fika does require coffee. Historically, we can say, you know, yes, but I'm pretty sure people are going to argue with me about that. Uh, but it also goes to show that by 1910, coffee really had become a, a sort of truly Swedish drink for all the Swedes. And if we look back at it today, it doesn't seem like much has changed. So that's my, that's the end of my portion of the uh, presentation. So I'm going to hand control back, I believe. To Alexander. Yes, if the Thank you. allows me to. I'm going to have to stop sharing, I think. Uh, how do I do this? Um, how do I do this? <laughs> Alexander, do, do you know where the button is? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Uh, how do I... Uh, well, we can, uh, I'll figure this out and we can uh, continue with the questions perhaps in the meantime, if you want to start that off, Alexandra, and I will figure out how to give this back to you. <laughs> oh, good. Yes. No, oh, no, it, it, just as you say, if anyone uh, wants to kick off with the first question, we'd be really happy. Um, uh, Lou is, is, is applauding, but, but not asking a question at this time. You, you remember to unmute yourself if you have a question, please. Hello. Let's see who's 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 talking. Is it That's Lucy? Me, Lucy, yeah. Um, Hi, Lucy. Thank you very thank you very much. Lucy, I've really, sat, I've sat about. Yeah, it was really fascinating. I just want to say thank you very much. Really interesting. And I don't have a question. I just have a point of interest that my husband is the direct descendant of David Alf Sanderberg, who was the director of the Swedish East India Company. Ah, and, cool. Yeah, and he made several two-year voyages from Gothenburg to Canton, and um, which was in the mid 18th century. So, wow. not not a question, but I just thought a point of interest. Yeah. Lucy is is yeah. backing the, um, the the tea side of Sweden. <laughs> anyway, thank yeah. you very much. It was really yeah. interesting. Mm. No, that's, that's that's fascinating. It's not the first time we've we've had somebody in the audience. Um, have a direct um, link with one of the things that we've been talking about. So that's um, absolutely amazing. Next time we meet Lucy, I'll definitely ask you more about that. Yeah, he, and he was married to um, Maria Chambers, who was the um, sister of William Chambers, the architect. Mm. Mm. So he's, oh. he's an interesting, he's a very interesting man. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, anyway, yeah definitely. Thank you I mean, very much. It was really interesting. I'm, sure. I'm, 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 glad, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, and yeah, it's, it, well, I think what surprised me the most was how prominent Swedish tea imports were. Uh, I didn't realize that it was such a big part of, in particular, uh, the Swedish East India Company's kind of whole operation and how much of the, uh, much of the buildings in, in Gothenburg, are in fact, much of the grander building works in Gothenburg were funded by what's in effect tea money, which is something I did not, I did not mm. realize until, uh, until we mm. started looking into this. Fascinating. So um, what about this concept of, Fika only being possible with a coffee. I did actually ask a Swede that, and I got a very strange look, as though it was a very stupid question. But that was because he believed he believed a Fika was any drink with any food, which I think is completely no. wrong. No, no, right. no, no, thank you, Alexander. No, exactly. <laughs> I can't be right. <laughs> but what about specifically with tea? Because if it, if it's allowed with tea, I don't. I think Eric's right. I think it has to be coffee. Um, for whatever that means, yeah, you agree. I, I mean, I, 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 I hand up who thinks tea, uh, co uh, coffee only for a fika. I think so. Mm. Fika, yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm split. I think one party needs to have a coffee, and then the other party can have a tea, and it's still fine. But it needs to be present. The art of, of Swedish compromise. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh dear. I, I'm going to ask about um, the um, the shift in coffee from um, Turkish style. Is that when mm. you boil the coffee in kuk kafe, you boil exactly. it in the water, right, to the drip feed or cafetiere or whatever, where you filter all the thing out? Yes. Because I think in rural areas, and I've been uh, in. Um, in rural areas where I've been um, offered uh, kaffe yerk. Who knows what kaffe yerk is apart from Eric? 
<laughs> Elizabeth knows I can see a few people here. Uh, and, and, and the recipe was given is, and this is uh, the, uh, the relative um, order and gentility of coffee is combined with uh, distilled uh, drinks from a still uh, at the back of somebody's uh. barn. Uh, so what you do is you, um, this is explained to me in detail, you, you, um, you, you, you pour coffee out and then you pour and then you, you drop a silver coin into the bottom and then you pour moonshine in until you see this, the silver coin and then you top it up again with, with coffee until the, the silver coin disappears. And then it's the correct <laughs> strength. <laughs> It's, well, it sounds like a student's a, drinking game. It does, doesn't it? Well, yeah. No, it's a it's a rural it's a rural tradition. They told me, and of course, I believed them. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. Hello, I've got a question. Mm -hmm. Hello. Let's um, see who's asking. Oh yes, Diana. Diana. Diana hello. 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 Thank you so much, and sorry for joining late. Um, um, First of all, I have to say I am absolutely daunted by the fact how it, it coffee itself and um, the philosophy around coffee is shaped the history um, and about the politics. I was wondering if Eric, if you if you've done any research or if you know if it affected the bilateral relationships between nations. The uh, coffee, I mean, if I don't know if someone from a royal would travel from let's say Sweden to Denmark or to the UK. Um, this coffee philosophy, would it be something that would bond the nation somehow, indirectly, the way it did the, the country itself? I think uh, that's actually a really good question. And it's something I, I did think about while doing it, but it was actually, actually quite hard to find direct kind of, I don't know, like evidence or information on it. Um, but what was, I think, implied in a, in a lot of cases were, for example, it was call it at least implicitly political that when Charles XII returned from Sweden, he returned with, like, he returned being a big supporter of coffee because Sweden's largest ally at the time was the Ottoman Empire. So it sort of did have this undertone of, while it might not have been explicitly a sort of policy to gain favor with the Ottomans, it was a sort of, call it a form of cultural exchange to bring these two nations closer. Um, but then beyond that, I think it played a bigger role in domestic policy than it did in, uh, in uh, international policy. So it, it, it was more a question of, say, originally, as, as, as you said, when the, uh, when the aristocrats banned the, the practice of moonshining in the country, the peasants responded with basically pushing through a ban of coffee. And then later on, you also have the kind of angle to the various labor movements and the teetotal movements and so on that, that obviously have profound uh, in, like internal effects and profound kind of effects on internal policies. Uh, but beyond the sort of implicit things of say, uh, and I can imagine it being a similar thing for Britain as well with there's, there being implicit political goals in gaining the tea of say, you know, the various wars I'm sure have been fought over this. Uh, but it wasn't really that the tea itself became the sort of focal point that brought two sides together, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, so it sounds uh, very, very interesting. And I've got one last question, uh, which is not uh, international policy related in the politics. What's everyone yeah. drinking? What's your, I'm always looking for different types of coffees. Um, I'm, I'm a, a huge lover of uh, filter coffee in the morning, but if anyone is into different brands and I use Lavazza coffee beans, so I, I grab my own coffee. I find that there is a difference in the flavor, but I'm always... I've got friends that email me different types of coffee, so I look forward to hear from you, actually, if anyone has got some views on it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you. You shouldn't ask me, because I'm a bit of a heathen. I, uh, the, the British, unfortunately, love to drown things in milk, and coffee is just the same as tea. So I, I'm not an espresso person, I'm afraid to say. I, I'm, I'm ashamed of it, but there it is. And I do like a cappuccino, which, as you know, is about 90% milk. So you better ask somebody like Eric or some of the other people who, who clearly know their coffees well. Uh, I've, I've, I've been told once that my, my drisk, drip coffee is like diesel, so I'm not <laughs> sure how much you want to ask me this. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I, 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 so, Eric, uh, 
Uh, Okado does Suegas skull roast. Yeah, I, I know. I've, I've finally realized this and it made me so happy. I used to import it from Helsingborg actually, uh, whenever I went back. <laughs> it was ve very precious to me. Um, but, but I will say that speaking on like, to be pedantic with coffee and so on, um, the Suegas skull was actually, this is going to sound so pretentious, actually tasted better in Helsingborg because the roast itself is done to fit with the hardness of the local water, the local tap water. And therefore it kind of has quite a profound effect as to what it tastes like, whether, whether you have it at Helsingborg or say London or anywhere else, I imagine. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, water makes a huge difference. You think it's just in the background, but it could ruin something if it's, if, I mean, as, as we know with tea, if you, if you prepare it in the wrong way and you're actually interested in the delicate flavors of the individual leaves, um, you, you know, you, you are not going to get that with, with mucky old water and any old temperature. So there's an art, there's a real art form to tea and, and actually to coffee, which, uh, you know, sometimes we don't have time for, which is a shame. But you, you uh, I actually have a question for you, David, on this. <clears throat> you didn't really touch on the whole, uh, call it philosophical debate as to what goes in first when a Brit makes tea. What's the proper order between sugar, tea, milk, uh, and so on? Well, as I, as I implied, it's just tea followed by more tea. But if you have to adulterate it uh, with either milk or sugar, well, first of all, sugar, you, you can't. I mean, if, you, if you're asking the question about sugar, there is no right order. You should just drink it alone in a darkened room and hope to get away with it. But in terms of, of, um, of, of milk and, and, and the tea itself, Personally, being very careful now, I prefer to have the tea and then add a small amount of milk to that tea rather than the other way around. But there are others. Robert, I think Robert may have a strong view on this, who's, who's still listening. He may have a view that you should do it the other way around. You have to unmute yourself first, Robert. Um, no, no view. I'm not going to be drawn on this. I don't drink tea. You're not going to be drawn. Very good. Part, I like part, that. Uh, uh, part of my religion not to drink tea. Okay, well, yeah, then you're... Oh, no, that, that, that is radical. <laughs> to be serious, uh, the, the correct way has to be tea first. Yeah. Milk oh, and no sugar. Yes, I'd, I'm with Robert on that. And really, you shouldn't have anything in the tea. Liz, Liz, Liz is saying you don't adulterate the tea at all. Yeah, she's right. She's right. Just, and to make a pot of, pot of tea, you must put the jug first. Or whatever you're using the teapot, and then afterwards, when you swizzled it out, got really hot, then you put the tea leaves in, and that way, first, no. but unfortunately, tea bags have ruined tea. Yeah, I was going to really? say that this is classes, yeah. uh, us um, upper class people <laughs> never use tea bags, do we? We always use leaf tea. Yeah. There, there, one, any... thing I, one thing I would say. Uh, and I shall get drummed out of the Anglo-Swedish society for saying it. Uh, Swedes make a great business about fika, wonderful coffee, and so forth. Uh, my time in Sweden has been incredibly disappointed by the quality of the coffee. Yeah. If you go to Helsinki or Helsingfors, if you prefer, uh, the quality of the coffee there is infinitely better. Ooh, the, the, them spiting words. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. <laughs> I think we'll have another war. <laughs> well, probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, going to, I'm just going to move back to tea just before there is a war. Saying what a wonderful um, uh, trip to um, with, with Lou we had uh, exploring yeah. uh, alcoholic and non-alcoholic teas. That was very fascinating. We, yeah, I wish we could do that again, Lou. Yeah. Well, were you there? Let's do that. Yeah. Oh, good. Yes, we, we should try to arrange another one when everything is more calm. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun. So it was yeah. the idea was to infuse tea leaves in alcohol. And uh, I, if you if you missed it last time, I will arrange a new one. <laughs> that that sounds amazing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we need to do this again, definitely. I'm in. It's amazing. It's amazing. 
<laughs> and also the host, Timothy Dolfe, he, he chose a Swedish vodka as well, I think. That was quite interesting. Mm. Mm. Good. Excellent. Do we have any, any more comments or questions on yeah. tea, I've coffee or anything in between? Yes, I of course. Emma, 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 for my council member, Emma. Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, I wondered if you'd read this book, Coffee Land. Have you seen it? No, but I oh, will make a note of it now. It. It's about uh, the epic story and how coffee connected and divided the modern world. So I recommend it. I've just started it. It's absolutely fascinating. So anybody who wants to know more about coffee, yeah, politics. That's great. Um, it's absolutely brilliant book. So I've only just started. Forward it. To that. You might be interested. My, my birthday's coming up soon. Just, just uh, I prefer nothing. <laughs> it's by um, Augustine Sedgwick. If you want to find it. Right. Thank you. Right. It's definitely on our list. Good. Are we? Um... Well, we've run over. We've overrun a little yeah. bit, but I'm very Good. happy to keep um, um, the, the the Zoom running if if one or two, or everyone wants to just chit chat. Um, I, I have um, uh, for um, for Eric um, mm -hmm. a, 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 a a nice thank you bottle here, uh, oh, and, and also <laughs> also for <laughs> also one here, a completely different one here for David. Oh, right. So, Thank you. So if you wouldn't yeah, reach just, out, yes, yes. There we go, just yeah. hold, it up to the, hold it up to the lens and I'll drink it from my end. I'm sure it works that way. <laughs> yes. It, it might be easier with a straw, David. <laughs> a straw, sir, for champagne, never. Through a camera. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. A special lens. Anyway. So, um, angle, anyway, it's, it'll be waiting when, when next we meet, because because really yeah. you've, you've um, yeah. uh, entertained and um, and um, enlightened us in equal measure as 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 you did last year and the year before. So, so thank you very much. It's it, and it's okay. very nice to have some talks in house where where we have uh, members giving us you know the the the, the, the talk and, and not some random person from somewhere else. Uh, very grateful, and it's lovely to see everyone. Uh, mo mostly familiar faces, one or two um, darkened squares on on the screen. But maybe next time we can get cameras all round. Um, yeah. So the next, Sorry, I next just, one. Sorry, I just bathed my children, so I'm uh, I'm I'm a bit wet. Basically, that's why. <laughs> 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 and yes, that's, uh, yeah, uh, you, you keep uh, the uh, visual off, please. Yeah. We're, we're <laughs> pause. Yes, that's a good. Yeah. Um, again, I, I've said it before, uh, but the uh, Selma Logan of um, 8th of August, no, no, 4th of August, yep. uh, and uh, Caroline Bogus Rolf on the 9th of September, uh, both uh, very nice uh, uh, events, and uh, same time, same place. I will send yeah. out, um, yeah, if you exactly. haven't uh, emailed, then just email a response and, and we'll sign you up and send the, the, the login details link. it's, it's a different link each time so right you'll have to you'll have to sign up separately yeah you don't want to be zoom bombed by people do we you're right well you hear some embarrassing you things do. happen but you do yes. so i've to, so i've been told anyway that's great thank you very much and uh, lovely to well, see so everybody th thank you thank you both and thank you everyone yeah. thank you thank okay you. thank see you everybody coming, soon everyone. Bye. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you to both speakers uh, and for all the hard work that went into it. Thank you very much for listening. Take care, guys. Thank you, Eric.